A Chinese man is on day three of a hunger strike. He's protesting after police forcibly vaccinated him. Another man pinned down on the ground by Chinese policemen, all because he refused to get tested for the CCP virus. Is China's pandemic cure worse than the disease? The country's strict lockdown measures reportedly played a major role in the death of one man. Victims in China still suffering after major flood damage. They report receiving little compensation despite massive destruction. That's after authorities opened the floodgates of a local reservoir without warning. And Chinese shopping giant Alibaba plans to invest more than $15 billion into helping the communist regime achieve its goals. That's amid Beijing's clampdown on big tech. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A Chinese resident is protesting against local authorities' CCP virus vaccine mandate. That's after police showed up at his door, saying he would be sent to a mental hospital if he refused to be vaccinated. NTD's Juliet Song has more. A Chinese resident is going on a hunger strike to protest against the local vaccine mandate. I'm firmly against the mandate. It's my third day of strike. Zane's protest comes after an incident with local police. He has heart disease and has been resisting local authorities' vaccine mandate. But three days ago, a group of police officers showed up at his door, telling him that every single person in his local area had to get vaccinated and that he'd be sent to a mental hospital if he refused. Police later arrested Zane after he continued to reject the order. Zane explained the officers later held him down in a car and vaccinated him by force. Police released him afterwards. Zane's incident comes as China aims to vaccinate 80 percent of its population. And in at least eight provinces, county-level authorities have warned residents will be barred from schools and hospitals if they don't get the jab in time. In one county in Jiangxi province, authorities posted a notice saying, everyone is responsible for the prevention and control of the epidemic, and vaccination starts with me. The post added that the unvaccinated residents won't have access to public services like medical facilities and public transportations as of late July onward. As for Zane, he says he's not just protesting for himself. If we don't protest now, what are our future generations going to do? Do we just work like a horse or ox and won't even dare to make a sound even when we get beaten up? While his protest is underway, Zane says he fears for his safety. He says if there are no new updates posted on his social media account in the coming days, it likely means he was taken away by the police and lost his personal freedom. Julia Song, NTD News. Authorities in China are reportedly not taking no for an answer. That's when they want someone to get tested for the CCP virus. A video published online in recent weeks captured one of the extreme strategies. A clip shows an older man in South China inside his home. Police and medical personnel entered the room and held the man down on the ground. While he was pinned there, medical staff swabbed his cheek. That sample will likely be used for virus testing. Now we look to a tragedy. A Chinese internet user claims his neighbor died because he couldn't get timely medical assistance due to lockdown measures. In a social media post, the internet user wrote the neighbor tried to call the hotline for an ambulance, but was told the hospitals nearby are closed during the pandemic and that no ambulance is available. The internet user adds that two police officers were nearby but refused to help. Later, another neighbor took the patient in his car and went out to look for medical help. After they left, the two officers came by to check on them and asked who allowed them to leave. NTD cannot independently verify the authenticity of this post. Judging from the locations mentioned in the comments, the user is from Yangzhou. That city is in southeast China and has been a virus hotspot. Authorities there have been imposing strict lockdown measures since early August. That includes forbidding residents in certain high-risk areas from leaving their homes. And if a resident in those areas needs to go out to get groceries, they have to have several things. A permission slip, a health code, a negative test and a temperature check. And every such household can only send one person out to buy groceries every three to five days. Several days ago, local authorities loosened up the rules, and residents in designated areas are now allowed to leave their homes, but they still cannot leave their residential compound. 
A chemical plant with connections to China's military reportedly had a major explosion at around 8 a.m. on Thursday in China's Sanxi province. Residents say the blast could be heard from nearly two miles away. Some said the ensuing shockwave shattered their windows and damaged their walls. Online videos show a mushroom cloud many stories tall. A local in the area said, I heard it at home in the morning. A huge sound shocked me. The window in my house shattered. The wall of my house was cracked. I was still sleeping. I thought it was an earthquake. Chinese media say so far there are no casualties, just minor injuries. The cause of the explosion is still being investigated. The factory is the Jiangyang chemical plant. According to Chinese encyclopedias, this plant is a backbone in the military industry in China. This is the second chemical plant in Shenzhi province to blow up in six months. In April, the Xing'an chemical plant also exploded. After floods devastated China's Henan province, a victim from one of the province's cities tells the Epoch Times that the authorities may have caused the damage intentionally. He says they released reservoir water into the city without warning residents ahead of time. NTD's Don Ma has more. A local flood victim in central China's Henan province tells the Epoch Times that the flooding is a man-made disaster, not a natural one. He says that's because flooding there was a result of authorities discharging reservoir water. He lives in the Weihui City district of the province. The newspaper gave him a pseudonym to protect his identity. We didn't think they would discharge floodwaters. If they didn't discharge floodwaters, Weihui City would be totally fine. The day was July 23rd, and rains had already stopped in the city. But locals found it unusual that the water levels continued rising. The authorities had already started discharging water without warning. Locals were confused. The sky was clear, rain had stopped. How come the water level is rapidly rising? Nobody knew why, but the authorities knew. There is no question about it. If they just warned people, there would have been fewer losses. Mr. Lin said there was a rumor going around that the authorities may have intended to flood Weihui City. Before the water discharge, there was a rumor, flood Weihui City to save Xinxiang City. At the time, everyone did not want to believe it. They wouldn't flood Weihui City, right? Lin says not only did authorities not give them a warning, they actually told residents that water levels would be going down. There was no warning. Conversely, they sent out a message saying that water levels were going down noticeably in the afternoon. This is a huge deception. It misled all of the residents. All their valuables were not transferred out of the city because of this. Not only are authorities not helping residents very much, but they even locked up flood victims when the CCP Premier Li Keqiang came to visit Henan. It was to make sure they don't protest during such a high-level CCP visit. They drove locals to a gymnasium in Xinxiang City and just locked the gate. They even put up metal fences to prevent entering and exiting. They were released later. It was just because there was a high-level visit. The flooding resulted in more than hundreds of thousands of dollars in damages for locals. But authorities are giving them little compensation. Thousands have protested for more aid, but to little avail. Don Ma, NTD News. Chinese shopping giant Alibaba plans to invest $15.5 billion to keep China achieve what it's calling common prosperity. That's amid the Chinese regime's clampdown on big tech. Major players across the board were hit by the regulatory suppression, including e-commerce platforms like Alibaba, rideshare giant Didi, and several video game developers. According to a Chinese state-run publication, Alibaba aims to use the investment in a variety of ways, including bringing tech to less developed regions of the country and to help support the growth of small businesses and agriculture. Alibaba was recently fined $2.8 billion by the Chinese regime in an anti-monopoly probe. China's cyber watchdog has a new target, those who badmouth China's economy and financial markets. And the country's cyber authority is citing several examples. They include misinterpreting China's economic policies and reposting foreign media's, quote, distorted interpretations of China's financial news.
Authorities say the crackdown seeks to create a benign online environment to help foster the healthy growth of China's economy. But just who will feel the effects? Social media accounts that post finance-related news and commentary, plus websites and media companies that cover Chinese finance and economy. Examples include social media tech giants like WeChat, Weibo, and TikTok's parent company ByteDance. These platforms have pledged to follow Beijing's rule, and some of them have already started shutting down accounts deemed in violation. The campaign is set to last until the end of October. China's leading tutoring company, Giant Education, announced its closure on Tuesday. It said it would close in the fall due to business difficulties. The institute added it couldn't refund the tuition to its over 10,000 students who had fully paid for their courses, but it would help the students transfer to other education institutions. It also told its employees that it's experiencing a hard time in mulling possible directions for the company, but that before their plan is finalized, all expenditure would be suspended. An administrator who served in the company for four years revealed to local media that the administrators hadn't got salary since June, nor employees since July, and that their social security benefits had also been discontinued. Giant Education is one of China's oldest tutoring companies. It offered classes in math, English and exam preparation for nearly 30 years. It serves students from kindergarten to high school. According to its 2017 report, every year the institution enrolled 300,000 students across the country. Giant Education is the latest victim of the Chinese regime's crackdown on off-campus education. But it's not the first. An English tutor company named Wall Street English filed for bankruptcy last month. It is the first large education company in China to go bankrupt after the regime's July crackdown on off-campus education. That company had annual enrollments of nearly 200,000 students, making it one of the world's largest English language tutors. This year, already 140,000 tutoring companies have closed, according to Chinese media outlet Caixinnet. Beijing's latest clampdown target, Airbnb-style rentals. According to reports, many short-term rental platforms were ordered to remove most of their listings in Beijing. Some operators say under the new policy, they can no longer run their business. China's capital city is seeing a new directive. Major Chinese Airbnb-style rental platforms removed their listings in the city last week in accordance with an order reportedly prompted by Beijing authorities. According to local media reports, city officials summoned nine short-term rental platforms for a meeting early last week. During the talks, they ordered the platforms to remove so-called non-compliant properties in the city within seven days, except rural listings. The platforms include Airbnb, Trip.com, Meituan, and Alibaba-owned Fliggy. One of the platform's operators told Chinese media Saixin that the removed properties accounted for 70 percent of the platform's listings in Beijing. The sudden removals have stoked speculation of a wider crackdown recently seen in China, and the city's landlords already appear to be suffering. It's all off the lists. You can't open the links. That means losing money and no income, definitely. Hundreds of thousands of yuan of investment for a house. Now it's being banned. That is, how to say, such a rip-off. Landlords may be allowed to resume operating their urban listings, but only if they can submit additional documents. One landlord told Chinese media Tsai Xin that she was required to upload eight documents, including written consent for the use of the property for short-term rental, proof of property ownership, the operating license for the property, and security guarantee documents signed by the local police bureau. But Wu says those documents aren't so easy to get. They, officials, wouldn't provide the documents. No way. I don't understand. The country's policy is always changing. A Beijing scholar told Radio Free Asia that it's very difficult for landlords to get these documents, adding that under the new policy, people from other provinces will pay a higher cost for accommodations in Beijing. That way, people who aren't on the authorities' good side like petitioners and human rights activists, will find it more difficult to stay in the city. U.S. electric car maker Tesla reportedly halted some of its operations in China last month. Bloomberg said Thursday that part of a production line at Tesla's Shanghai plant stopped for about four days because of a lack of key chips. Unnamed sources told the outlet production is now back to normal. 
It comes amid a global shortage of semiconductors. Last month, the world's largest automaker, Japanese Toyota Motors, said it would slash global production for September by 40 percent from its previous plan due to a chip shortage. China is likely to maintain strict limitations on international flights into next year. This could make tourism businesses in the region suffer. China is set to maintain strict curbs on international flights well into next year. That is according to analysts who have heard from the country's top airlines. And the news could spell trouble for tourism businesses around the region, where Chinese travelers play an outsized role. Last month, China's aviation regulator said weekly international flights were still only at 2% of 2019 levels. Now the country's three biggest airlines have all said restrictions could last through the first half of 2022. Analysts say Air China, China Southern and China Eastern all said as much during earnings calls. February's Winter Olympics in Beijing are reportedly one factor, with the government wanting to maintain a preventive approach to infections. Air China management told analysts that recovery would be slower than in Europe or the US. One analyst told Reuters that could mean a full recovery for Chinese air travel doesn't come until 2024. Others have been cutting their forecasts for airline earnings. For now, the firms are stuck with strict limits. Chinese carriers can operate one flight a week on one route to any country. Foreign airlines are allowed one flight a week to China. Imagine a scenario where if a ship wanted to sail through the international waters of the South China Sea, they'd have to ask for Communist China's permission first. Beijing just turned that scenario into a reality. A new Chinese maritime law that went into effect on Wednesday orders nearly all foreign vessels to apply for a permit before entering Chinese territorial waters. If Beijing deems that a foreign vessel is a threat, the Chinese law gives themselves the authority to exercise hot pursuit on that vessel. It means pursuing a vessel into the high seas and getting it back for trial. But China claims 90 percent of the South China Sea as its own. That's despite an international tribunal's 2016 ruling that those claims have no merit. The U.S. Department of Defense rejects the new law. Pentagon spokesman John Supple says the United States remains firm that any coastal state law or regulation must not infringe upon navigation and overflight rights enjoyed by all nations under international law. Unlawful and sweeping maritime claims, including in the South China Sea, pose a serious threat to the freedom of the seas. This year, NTD will hold its ninth international classical Chinese dance competition. We sat down with one of the competition's most recent medalists to understand what makes a dancer shine. Since its inception in 2007, the competition has attracted some of the world's most enchanted classical Chinese dancers, including dancers from Shen Yun. Victor Li from Sun Yun won silver last year. This is his fifth year competing, and it hasn't been easy. The first time I didn't even make it from our school selection. Um, I remember I kind of like cried. <laughs> I kind of like ran out of the, the theater. But that didn't stop him. And then the third time I joined, I got bronze. And the fourth time I got silver. And then, so I guess every time I'm just trying to push myself to improve, um, try to kind of compete against myself to do better. His formula for success, persistence, and a good mindset. If you're positive and if you're really like cheerful all the time, that actually does affect me physically because our daily schedule is so like tiring and could be really stressful. So if you're kind of like depressed, or if you think that you're tired, it's actually gonna make the day a lot worse for you. But then if you stay positive and like uh, cheerful, um, it kind of like helps yourself and your environment. And he incorporates that into his dance style. My style is more lighthearted and um, I don't like to do like really angsty or like kind of like depressing dances. Um, So I wanted to do like (laughs) kind of like a lighthearted, but then still, having like a, like a good moral type of dance. He said for dancers, it's important to make the movements grand and expressive. And what helps with that is one dance training he received at Shen Yun, Shen Dai So, or the body leads the hands, and Kwa Dai Tui, or the hips lead the legs. 
uh, from our innermost uh, middle core area, we start our movements from here. So our movements have like a bigger range. The once lost technique is deemed to be the most difficult of or the best in classical Chinese dance skills. Because um, we prepare to go on stage, so we need to make sure that our acting and our movements is really clear to the audience, even though they could be sitting like very far away. So we try to make our movements as big as possible. The technique also improves the dancer's ability to spin. We think about spinning, not with our hands, but with our body. We try to rotate with our body to spin faster. And enhances jumps and tumbling. The Dance Starry Lee choreographed this year is about a novice archer learning archery from a Taoist cultivator. But instead of teaching archery, the Taoist asked the young man to meditate, and after that... He finds out that even though he never practiced archery, he's suddenly really good at it. And then when he turns around, he sees that his teacher left, and that's when he knows that um, his teacher actually came to teach him cultivation. Inspired by a Chinese fable, the story embodies the ancient belief that every trade is a way of self-cultivation, and it is through moral and spiritual improvements that one excels at his techniques. Even though like a lot of the, the Chinese culture, Chinese morals are like thousands of years old, but I do still feel like they can still affect us now. So for Chinese like history, there's some um, like thousands of stories that you can kind of look back. And a lot of times if we're going through problems, uh, we can even look back in history and see if there's similar problems and how they were solved or what um, could have been done better. And a lot of times we can apply that to ourselves. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.